Good morning, sisters and brothers, and welcome to this morning's morning prayer. Today is uh, Thursday, the 9th of the 8th, the 9th, Thursday, the 8th of August. And um, in the church today, we are remembering um, Dominic, priest and founder of the Order of Preachers. He died in the year 1221. That's Dominic, who was a priest and the founder of the Order of Preachers. All right, so let's pray and commit this day to the Lord. Give him all that this day holds, our life, our health, our, our strength, and, and uh, our family, and indeed the world, entrust, commit it all to the Lord afresh this new day. Let us pray. O Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Blessed are you, sovereign God, creator of all. To you be glory and praise forever. You founded the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. In the fullness of time, you made us in your image. And in these last days, you have spoken to us in your Son, Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh. As we rejoice in the gift of your presence among us, let the light of your love always shine in our hearts. Your spirit ever renew our lives, and your praises ever be on our lips. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God forever. Amen. The night has passed and the day lies open before us. Let us pray with one heart and mind. As we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you, now and forever. Amen. And our first canticle this morning. I have given you as a light to the nations, and I have called you by name, and I have called you in righteousness. <clears throat> Thus says God, who created the heavens, who fashioned the earth and all that dwells in it, who gives breath to the people upon it and spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord and I have called you in righteousness. I have taken you by the hand and kept you. I have given you as a covenant to the people, a light to the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the captives from the dungeon from the prison, those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory I give to no other. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and shall be forever. Amen. I have given you as a light to the nations, and I have called you in righteousness. Our psalm this morning, <coughs> Psalm 78. <coughs> psalm 78 from verse 1 to 39. <coughs> 
Hear my teaching, O my people. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will pour forth mysteries from of old. Such as we have heard and known, which our forebears have told us, we will not hide from our children, from, we will not hide from their children, but will recount to generations to come the praises of the Lord and his power and the wonderful works he has done. He laid a solemn charge on Jacob and made it a law in Israel, which he commanded them to teach their children that the generations to come might know and the children yet unborn, that they in turn might tell it to their children so that they might put their trust in God and not forget the deeds of God but keep his commandments and not be like their forebears, a stubborn and rebellious generation a generation whose heart was not steadfast and whose spirit was not faithful to God. The people of Ephraim, armed with the bow, turned back in the day of battle. They did not keep the covenant of God and they refused to walk in his law. They forgot what he had done and the wonders he had shown them. For he did marvelous things in the sight of their forebears, in the land of Egypt, in the field of Zoan. He divided the sea and let them pass through. He made the waters stand still in a heap. He led them with a cloud by day and all the night through with a blaze of fire. He split the hard rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink as from the great deep. He brought streams out of the rock and made water gush out like rivers. Yet for all this, they sinned more against him and defied the Most High in the wilderness. They tested God in their hearts and demanded food for their craving. They spoke against God and said, Can God prepare a table in the wilderness? He struck the rock indeed, so that the waters gushed out and the streams overflowed. But can he give bread or provide meat for his people? When the Lord heard this, he was full of wrath. A fire was kindled against Jacob, and his anger went out against Israel. For they had no faith in God, and they put no trust in his saving help. So he commanded the clouds above, and he opened the doors of heaven. He rained down upon them manna to eat, and gave them the grain of heaven. So mortals ate the bread of angels. He sent them food in plenty. He caused the east wind to blow in the heavens and let out the south wind by his might. He rained flesh upon them as thick as dust and winged fowl like the sand of the sea. He let it fall in the midst of their camp and round about their tents. So they ate and were, all, and were well filled for he gave them what they desired. But they did not stop their craving. Their food was still in their mouths when the anger of God rose against them and slew their strongest men and felled the flower of Israel. But for all this they sinned yet more and put no faith in his wonderful works. So he brought their days to an end like a breath and their years in sudden terror. Whenever he slew them, they would seek him. They would repent and earnestly search for God. 
They remembered that God was their rock and the Most High God their Redeemer. Yet they did but flatter him with their mouth and dissembled with their tongue. Their heart was not steadfast towards God. Neither were they faithful in his covenant. But he was so merciful that he forgave their misdeeds and did not destroy them. Many a time he turned back his wrath and did not suffer his whole displeasure to be roused. For he remembered that they were but flesh, a wind that passes by and does not return. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and shall be forever. Amen. And our prayer. God, our Deliverer, as you led our ancestors through the wilderness, so lead us through the wilderness of this world, that we may be saved through Christ forever. Amen. Amen. I, I do love this psalm. This is, this is actually a very long psalm. We've just read half of it. But it's a psalm um, reminding us of, of the faithfulness of God, yes, but the rebelliousness of God's people. Uh, you know, if you ever think of the people of God and and, and, and how God's people, um, uh, why indeed sometimes God's people are punished, God's people are, are, are not, do not get what, what they, what, you know, do not get the, 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 the prayers answered, you could say. It's because of the rebelliousness of our hearts. And yet, God is merciful. He gave them what they wanted. He gave them water to drink. He said, yes. They said, yes, he can give us water, but can he give us food? He gave them food. But even giving them food, the bread of heaven, the bread of angels, we are told, the food that angels eat, humans ate. God provided this. And even so, they still were rebellious and grumbled and God brought judgment upon them. In the first bit of this psalm, it talks about the fact that we are to, that, that we are to teach God's, God's, God's truth, God's word to our children, to the generations. Verse 6, that the generations to come might know and the children yet unborn, that they in turn might tell it to their children. We have a responsibility to, to teach our children the truths of God so that they will then teach their children, and so on. And that, and that, 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 that cycle of teaching the children and instructing our children in the ways of God will carry on and will continue throughout time. You know, I believe, I believe that the, 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 the predicament that our world is in today, and indeed our own country, it's because we, it's because the church has failed. The church has failed to teach our children the ways of God, to teach our children the commandments of God. You know, in Deuteronomy 6, God said, impress these truths upon the hearts of your children <clears throat> on generations upon generation so that they will then in turn teach it to their children. You know, the generations... Of, of, of many generations have passed and what has happened in our country in our families in our world is that we that we the church have failed in teaching the commands of the lord to our children and so they the, the children of our grandparents and 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 so on they have they're, they're now growing up without any compass in their lives, without any guidance. And so we see young people on the streets looting and causing mayhem because they have no 
spiritual value in their lives. They have no spiritual center. God is no, is no longer part of their lives. And so they, they do whatever their hearts tell them to do. And that is to, to commit crime, to do all sorts of, anar um, to, br to bring anarchy upon the land. Why? Because they have no guide. Because the, the church, the people of God, have failed to teach the generations the word of God. And, so that, and, and, and this, this goes all the way back, as I said. This is from the children of Israel in the wilderness to today. And so we need to get back to that, to teach our children the ways of God. All right, let's, let's move on. Our next canticle. <clears throat> Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned. I have called you by name. You are mine. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, and you are mine. Let's go to our first reading this morning, which is um, in in First Samuel. First Samuel thirty-one is our first reading this morning. Ah, the sun is, 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 is coming up behind me there. 1 Samuel 31. And this is the very end of Saul's life and Saul's reign. Now the Philistines attacked Israel, and the men of Israel fled before them. Many were slaughtered on the slopes of Mount Gilboa. The Philistines closed in on Saul and his sons, and they killed three of his sons, Jonathan, Abinadab, and Malkishua. The fighting grew very fierce around Saul, and the Philistine archers caught up with him and wounded him severely. Saul groaned to, to his armor-bearer, Take your sword and kill me before these pagan Philistines come to run me through and taunt and torture me. But his armor-bearer was afraid and would not do it. So Saul took his own sword and fell on it. When his armor-bearer realized that Saul was dead, he fell on his own sword and died beside the king. So Saul, his three sons, his armor-bearer, and his troops all died together that same day. When the Israelites on the other side of the Jezreel Valley and beyond the Jordan saw that the Israelite army had fled and that Saul and his sons were dead, they abandoned their towns and fled. So the Philistines moved in and occupied their towns. The next day, when the Philistines went out to strip the dead, they found the bodies of Saul and his three sons on Mount Gilboa. So they cut off Saul's head and stripped off his armor. Then they proclaimed the good news of Saul's death in their pagan temple and to the people throughout the land of Philistia. They placed his armor in the temple of the, uh, of the Ashtoreths and they fastened his body to the, well, to the wall of the city of Bethshan. But when the people of Jabesh Gilead heard what the Philistines had done to Saul, 
all their mighty warriors traveled through the night to Bethshan and took the bodies of Saul and his sons down from the wall. They brought them to Jabesh, where they buried, where they burned the bodies. Then they took their bones and, bur and buried them beneath the tamarisk tree at Jabesh. And they fastened, and they fasted, fasted, they fasted for seven days. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Saul's end, a violent end to a man who was once a great king, but lost his way through disobedience to God. And from the moment of that first disobedience, he, he started doing his own thing. This is it, sisters and brothers. We are to, it, the story of Saul is a reminder to us that we are that that as saw as Samuel as Samuel said to Saul to obey is better than sacrifice um it is it is one thing to give lip service to our to God in worship it is quite another thing to obey what God commands um, there are people who come to church on Sunday who, who sing praises very lustily and, 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 and very melodiously. But on Monday, they live their lives for themselves. They go about doing what they want to do rather than obeying what God commands. That was Saul. Saul thought, if I can sacrifice to the Lord, I can do what I want. If I, can, if I can offer worship to God, then I can, I can do my own thing. And Samuel said, no, it doesn't work like that, Saul. And Saul, eventually, the Spirit of God left Saul. And Saul be became depressed and, and he suffered from depression for the rest of his life. A spirit of melancholy, a spirit of... Uh, 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 a sad spirit upon uh, that came upon him that made him depressed and violent and, and hateful. The man who was God's chosen king lost his way uh, uh, dr dramatically, tragically, and in the end had a very tragic end to his life. His sons, Jonathan, Jonathan was a righteous man who sought to do well, but he also was loyal to his father as much as he could and still tried to, tried to help David. And he recognized upon David the hand of God. And he knew David was going to be the next king, not him, not Jonathan, because God is the one who chose kings, not, not your own you know, it, it, it wasn't, it wasn't the, the, you know, a succession, successive line. Jo Saul was hoping that Jonathan became the next king as a sort of line of succession. That is not the way God was working. And, so, and because Saul was no longer in tune with God, he, ha he, 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 was not, he, he wasn't able to discern what God wanted. He thought his son was going to sit on the throne. That's not, no, not at all. Um, and, 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 and so Saul died. Saul died a very tragic death. He, 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 he fell on his own sword, we are told, when his armor bearer refused to kill him. His armor bearer, uh, uh, a decent man, you could say, a man who, who served Saul, like Jonathan, um, uh, out of duty for the king. Even remember David didn't even want to put his hand on the king because from David's perspective Saul is the anointed king of God and even though the spirit of God had left Saul David respected the office of, a, of the king and, and the man who occupied that office may be horrible and wicked but the office is respected and David had the opportunity to kill him one day 
but refused because David says, it is not my duty to kill God's anointed king. And it's the same attitude here, the armor bearer. We would not do this because out of respect for the king. The king killed himself after he was wounded. He didn't want to be captured as prisoner and tortured, so he, he killed himself. And his armor bearer killed himself that day as well, as a, out, of, out of love and duty and respect to the king. His sons died, Jonathan, Abinadab, Malki, Malkishur, all died. And, and uh, the army of Israel that day was, um, was routed by the Philistines to the point where many of them fled from their villages and towns and the Philistines occupied it. It won't be for long because David will come. But they, they treated Saul's body with respect as you would do, not just for any believer, but for the king. They took the body away from the Philistines who were desecrating the body, brought it home, burned the body, and buried his bones. And they fasted for seven days. Again, God's king is dead. And, and so they spent seven days in prayer. It, it doesn't matter uh, the fact that, yes, he was, he, in his last days, he was not the king that God originally um, anointed. But he was still anointed until the day he died, he was still God's king. And so they respected that and fasted for seven days out of respect for what? For, for, for the death of Saul. And so that's the end of Saul's life and reign. And Saul's story is a lesson in obedience to all God's people. Obey is better than sacrifice. It is not enough just to give lip service to, to God in worship on Sunday. It's important that we do that. Yes, it's important. Worship and, uh, and all that is important. It's necessary, in fact, because we are built to worship. We are created to worship God. But we are also called to obey. And it's one thing to worship and it's another thing to obey. Um, and Saul would offer worship through his lips, through sacrifice, but obedience was missing. Our next reading uh, is in Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4 from verse 32 to chapter 5 and verse 11. <clears throat> All the believers were united in heart and mind. And they felt that what they owned was not their own. So they shared everything they had. The apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's great blessing was upon them all. There were no needy people among them, because those who owned land or houses would sell them and bring the money to the apostles to give to those in need. For instance, there was Joseph, the one the apostles nicknamed Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He was from the tribe of Levi, and he came from the island of Cyprus. He sold a field he owned and brought the money to the apostles. Chapter 5. But there was a certain man named Ananias, who with his wife Sapphira sold some property. <coughs> He brought part of the money to the apostles, claiming it was, it was the full amount. With his wife's consent, he kept the rest. Then Peter said, Ananias, why have you let Satan fill your heart? You lied to the Holy Spirit, and you kept some of the money for yourself. The property was yours to sell or not sell, as you wished. And after selling it, the money was also yours to give away. 
How could you do such a thing like this? You weren't lying to us, but to God. As soon as Ananias heard these words, he fell to the floor and died. Everyone who heard about it was terrified. Then some young men got up, wrapped him in a sheet, and took him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, Was this the price you and your husband received for your land? Yes, she replied, that was the price. And Peter said, How could the two of you even think of conspiring to test the spirit of the Lord like this? The young men who buried your husband are just outside the door, and they will carry you out too. Instantly she fell to the floor and died. When the young men came in and saw that she was dead, they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear gripped the entire church and everyone else who heard what had happened. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Quickly, a, a, a brief reflection. So the, 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 the early church began by, by people being very generous with their money. You know, we, 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 we are to remember, sisters and brothers, that this was very, this, the generosity of the church began at the very beginning of the people of God. Here, the church is in its infancy. You could say it's the first week. I mean, you know, the first few weeks or maybe even the first couple of days of the church. We are told that they, they decided to share everything they had. They, those who had extra would sell uh, the property and so on and bring the money to the, to the apostles for them to distribute it to others so that there will be no needy people among them. There will be no poor people among them. That was, the, that was how the church began. And the church continued that throughout, the, throughout its, its history. That's why the church is at the forefront of food banks and, and distribution of clothes and things like that in the community. Because the church is about being generous and helping those who are in need. So here, of course, the church is at the forefront of looking after the poor. Those who had surplus would bring some of what they have and give it to the apostles and they would share it with, with those who are poor. We are told about Barnabas. He had property. He sold property and he brought the money and the apostles would distribute the money to those in need. But we are told in one particular case of a husband and wife who who part of the church, yes, these were believers in the church, but they were not too much into this spirit. So what they did, and it's a warning to Christians everywhere. It was a warning then, and it's a warning throughout the ages. It's, uh, they, they sold their property, but they decided to keep back half for themselves and give half to the apostles, to the church. Now, nothing's wrong with that. As Peter said, it's your money. You can do whatever you want with it. But what they did was they pretended that this was all that they were giving. They were giving part, but lying to God, to the apostles, to the church, that they were giving all. And Peter discerned this through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit showed it to him that these two people, Ananias and his wife, Sapphira, they were, it, it wasn't because they didn't give all the money to the church, why they, they were judged severely by God. It's because they lied. We just talk about Saul in disobedience to God. It was, it's, a, it's, it's, it's their lying that, that, that got them in trouble. If they had come and said, you know, yes, we sold our property, 
but we wanted some of the money for, you know, to, to buy a new property on the coast of Cyprus or whatever. You know, we, we wanted some of it. We didn't realize it was good. We would have gotten this much for it. You know, prices are high these days and, and so forth and so on. But we are giving some of it to the church, but we want to keep back some for ourselves. There would be no problem at all. But what they did is that they pretended that they were giving all. They were caught up in this, in the euphoria of the moment. So many people were giving all the, and, and they didn't want to be seen as being stingy. They didn't want to be seen as not giving everything because their neighbor gave everything and the people up the street gave the everything. So we need to pretend that we are giving everything as well. And the Holy Spirit discerned their duplicity, their lie, their deception through Peter. And Peter said to them, both of them, why are you lying to the Holy Spirit? Why are you lying to God? You know, you are bringing this to the church. And by bringing this to the church, you are bringing it to God. Again, something that we need to understand. You know, people say, oh, they give their money to the church. Understand that when you give to the church, you are giving to God. You're not giving to some institution. You're not giving to a political party. You are giving to God. And so be careful how you give. Check your heart. What is in your heart when you give? Because these two people, it wasn't the amount they give. It was the deception, the duplicity, the lie of their giving. And Peter said, God is going to judge you severely. And of course, the judgment of God fell upon them that day. Now, God's judgment doesn't always fall that same day. Sometimes God's judgment is delayed. But as a lesson to the church then, and as a lesson to us today, God judged these two people summary, summarily, summer, summary judgment. They fell dead that very day because of their deception and their lying to God. Sisters and brothers, let us be careful how we, we give to God, how we worship. We talk about Saul's disobedience. Now we have two Christians, two believers in the church lying to the God in their giving uh, in, uh, and in the way they, they give their money. Again, it's not about the amount. It's not about how much you give. It's about where your heart is when you give. Are you being duplicitous? Are you being deceptive? Are you being truthful? Are you being honest in your giving? And do you recognize that when you give, you're not giving to the church. You are giving to God, says Peter. It is God who is receiving this because God is embodied in his people. Amen. Uh, it's been a long one. Let's, let's, let's pray. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we are grateful for this new day. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the word which is our food, our guide, our compass. Indeed, through your word, you give us life. And so, Lord, we thank you for the word and we pray that we will not leave this morning thinking, forgetting what we hear, like the man who looks in the mirror and forgets what he looks like. But help us, Lord, to go reflecting, meditating on your word today so that this word will, 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 will penetrate deep into our hearts and become part of our spiritual DNA so that our lives will be transformed by the truth of your word. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray, O oh God, for those in our hearts today, those in our community, those in our family, those for whom we pray. We ask, Lord, that you will give us grace um, Lord, in all, give all those who are sick, 
all those who are suffering in any way today, grace, your all-sufficient grace to sustain them, the grace of healing, the grace of strength in body, mind, and spirit. Lord, we pray for your people today. We pray for those who are suffering, for those who are in pain, for those who are undergoing treatment for cancer, those, Lord, you know in our own church family. We pray for them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our country. We continue to ask for your intervention in our own country at this time with, all, with the various riots going on across our country. We pray, Lord, for guidance for these young people who are, who are bringing, uh, who, who are perpetrating hate and terror upon various communities in our country. We pray that you will change their hearts and lives and, uh, and deter them from crime and violence, from the, from, from the, 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 the terror that they are striking in communities. And, and Lord, we pray that you will, that you will change, change the lives of these young people who are causing mayhem in our country at this time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the world. Again, we continue to ask, Lord, for your intervention in the wars and, and fighting in our world, in Sudan, in Ukraine, in Gaza, in Israel. Lord, we pray, change the hearts of humans everywhere who seek violence, who seek to use weapons of war as a means to to resolve their problems lord we pray that you will change their hearts we pray for peacemakers those lord raise up others who who want peace to strive for peace to work for peace and to bring peace to the to gaza to Ukraine, to Sudan, and wherever else there is conflict in our world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And let us, let's pray, let's um, pray the collect for today. <clears throat> Almighty God, whose servant Dominic grew in the knowledge of your truth and formed an order of preachers to proclaim the faith of Christ. By your grace, give to all your people a love for your word and a longing to share the gospel as he did, so that the whole world may come to know you and your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And our prayer, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.
Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look kindly upon you and give you his all-sufficient grace to sustain you today, sisters and brothers. <coughs> oh, excuse me. In all that you do and in your going and coming in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have a blessed day, sisters and brothers. Thank <laughs> you.